So good morning again. Uh, my name is Joe Belay. I'm a manager of uh, conservation demand management program delivery and business development at Toronto Hydro. And uh, the role of my team uh, is really to act as the interface between Toronto Hydro's customers and the incentive programs which are in place to promote conservation and energy efficiency in the marketplace. What I'll be talking about this morning is, interestingly enough, not strictly applicable only to Toronto Hydro. It really is going to cover all of the jurisdictions in Ontario because the, pro the programs are province-wide. So if you don't happen to be one of my customers, not a worry. A lot of what I'm going to say is going to apply equally as well to you. Just a little bit of background on myself. Um, I've been in uh, business within the energy field for longer than I care to recall, something approaching 30 years now. Um, I've had uh, the opportunity to work as a mechanical HVAC consultant. I've been a performance contractor in the past and I've also worked for a facilities management company. So I've had a pretty good exposure to energy management and, and conservation within the built environment for many years. Um, and uh, in addition to my responsibilities at Toronto Hydro, um, as of uh, I guess the end of last year, uh, I was the co-chair of the commercial and institutional working group which, uh, which working within the Ontario Power Authority was looking after all of the conservation programs in terms of the change management. And as I'll get into a little bit later this morning, the new governance model has also had the foresight of building in a, a business working group to do roughly the same function and uh, looks like uh, I didn't do so bad a job get get fired they've asked me to do the same role within the next uh, the next uh, gig so what that means is that I have a really good front row view of a lot of the change processes that are happening and what I'm trying to do this morning is to bring some of that kind of front row uh, visibility to you here this morning uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to do things a little bit differently. This is about the third or fourth year I think that I've done Springfest. And um, in the past we've kind of started and ended, had a question period and people carried on. What I'd like to do is um, break it up into actually two separate discussions. Uh, I'm going to start off with telling you a little bit about how the CDM programs are, are changing, a, a, an update if you will. And then I'd like to take uh, a few questions. And then at that point, if you're already familiar with the, the, the basics of conservation demand management programs, um, I would be perfectly fine if you wanted to excuse yourselves and, and, and leave because what I will be doing in the second part is really focusing it more on programs that are going to be continuing, which sneak preview look just like the ones that are in market right now. So if you're already familiar with that, it may be a little bit of a review for you, which you're uh, welcome to stay, uh, or if you'd like, you can excuse yourselves at that point as well. Okay. So, um, we uh, were in um, a 2011 to 2014 tranche of funding when the Ministry of Energy uh, issued a directive a little over a year ago to basically spell out what was going to happen in 2015 and beyond. And what they suggested or demanded was that the conservation programs would be continuing and they would be available starting in 2015. Um, the, the bottom line is that conservation isn't going to go away. We've got uh, another six years of funding. Uh, the reason for that, of course, is that conservation continues to be the most cost-effective form of meeting demand requirements. It's much cheaper to pay someone to save a kilowatt hour than it is to build a new plant or facility. Uh, what we are into though is a period of renewal and change. So, so even though a lot of the programs are, are continuing and that's good for the marketplace because we don't want to really upset the apple cart, we are really trying to enhance them and make them better than they were before because we've been listening to our customers. We know that they have wrinkles and warts and they needed to be fixed. So we will be doing that. We will also be providing and designing, developing new programs. So uh, this is really a good news story. One of the things that uh, of not uh, of notice that happened was that demand response. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, you're probably familiar with the Peak Saver program, which is that 
program that kind of controls your residential air conditioner. That's also a demand response type of program. But demand response, which is targeted at reducing peak consumption, peak hour electricity consumption, um, has been transitioned out of kind of the conservation file at the time. It was, the, it was part of the OPA's uh, uh, responsibilities to the independent electricity system operator. So that was one change. Um, one of the other changes was that um, the LDCs or the local distribution companies, all the utilities, suddenly they went from having targets that were not only kilowatt hours as well as kilowatts. The directive was changing that. It changed everything to a kilowatt hour type of a program. And that was very significant. Um, it, uh, it's not that they were uninterested in saving energy during the peak. Uh, what we've been told, the ministry was more interested in simplifying the programs. Now, uh, when you kind of went through the math, uh, it turns out that the targets that each LDC in Ontario were given uh, effectively doubled, more or less. And it may not be immediately apparent, but part of the, the reason is one of the big changes that happened uh, in the way that savings are acknowledged is in the past, in the 2011 to 14 tranche, um, if we saved, say if I retrofit this uh, lamp here with uh, an LED lamp, um, that savings for this year, oh hi Vic, I didn't see in the audience there, <laughs> that savings would uh, carry on and, and year after year and we were given credit for all of the following savings that would occur in subsequent years they've kind of changed the rules. Now we get credited only once. So by the time you work through the math, it's about a, a two times factor that, 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 that this, the hill is twice as steep as it was before, let's say. The reason why that's significant to you is that your LDC is going to be twice as eager to work with you on conservation than they were in the past. The other thing that kind of really happened, which uh, I think is a big sea change, is that there's a real intent within the directive, and I think uh, hats off to the independent electricity system operator, ISO. They really have uh, worked towards transitioning to this model, whereby the LDCs have a greater role in designing programs. And the reason why that's important is because you don't have a bunch of people sitting in an ivory tower now designing programs. What you have are people who are working with you day in, day out, understanding what your challenges are, what your barriers are, and trying to overcome those barriers with programs that are a little bit more um, uh, customer friendly perhaps than before. That's the, that's the theory. Now the practice is that it's going to take time before we transition from the old to the new. But that's the vision that we're heading towards. There's also the opportunity for LDCs to develop regional programs. And I think when you have unique LDCs, uh, jurisdictions like Toronto or like Hydro Ones out uh, in rural Ontario, that flexibility is, is much appreciated. And at, later on in the presentation, you'll see how we've kind of taken the liberty of, of developing pilots that mean a lot to our sort of customer base. And, and you'll get a sense of what we think that will develop in, into. The other thing that's extremely important, and this has been a valid criticism of the programs uh, all along, is that uh, as, a, as a representative of Toronto Hydro, I would go into a, uh, into a customer and talk only about electricity-based incentives, yet there's a, a gas utility there that has its own incentives that sometimes overlay or overlap exactly the same kind of technology you're looking at. And the valid criticism was that we weren't doing a good enough job of of working together. So we're trying to change that as part of the working group that I co-chair now. We actually have someone from the gas utilities actually sitting there with the intent of trying to develop programs in tandem. So what's been happening? Well, uh, the first thing that kind of happened even before the end of the year was that people looked at the name of the, the program and said we better do something because 2015 is rapidly approaching and these are 2014 programs. So they extended the program. So that was the first thing, to 2015. The next thing that happened on January 1st was uh, the Ontario Power Authority formally merged with, uh, with ISO. Um, and uh, it could have been um, a, a real disaster in terms of, uh, of 
of new people who weren't familiar with the programs, but it really was a, a merge. And so all of the, the uh, nice people we were working with at ISO, at OPA, are still there at ISO. So there's a huge relief from the continuity of the programs moving forward. Um, the, the directive um, wants LDCs to launch during 2015. Now, it doesn't say when. This is one of the kind of wrinkles in the program. So if you're living in Toronto, you can expect to see new programs or, or we'll move into the new program regime starting in, in July. If you're in another LDC, it may be a slightly different date. So over the course of 2015, all of the LDCs will basically merge into this new program. And um, the reason why that's important is really behind the scenes. We're talking about moving from one funding bucket to another. So for, for you as a customer, I'm going to kind of give you a sneak preview. It should be fairly transparent. In the background, it's hugely important from an accounting standpoint as to where the money is coming from to pay the, uh, the various incentive programs. And uh, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of work happening in the background already in getting to what I call the next generation of conservation programs. So we haven't been sitting idly waiting for the calendar pages to flip over. We've been working, have been working since the middle of 2014 on, on what new programs will look like. And there's a whole new uh, governance structure that's, uh, that's been established as well in, in the background. And that's important because you can't do a change in whatever is on the table unless you have all of the, the governance in place to, to do that. So, how should the marketplace react to all of these changes? Keep calm. Um, it's, from your standpoint, it should be business as usual. And I think at this point, you could probably leave this presentation because that's the most important piece. Don't actually leave, but that's the most important piece of information here. It's business as usual. There's a couple of spots where uh, we have to be careful because as we're going from one funding bucket to another funding bucket, uh, there's a transition that we have to be mindful of. But we're here to help you uh, th through that. Uh, and the success for me looks like you not knowing the difference. Okay, um, in the next few slides, I kind of debated a bit. There's probably a little bit more information that you really need, um, but uh, I figured that some, some people will, will probably appreciate the additional information. And others, if, the, if your projects don't kind of fall, then you have my permission to doze off for a couple of minutes. I'll wake you up again when we get beyond it. Um, what we have here is my attempt to uh, portray graphically what the new programs look like. So we have a calendar along the bottom here and we've got the old uh, legacy 2011 to 14 programs and you can see they've carried on into 2015. So if you're a customer uh, and you're sitting, we're sitting right about here right now and you have a, a, a project, you, you could apply for incentives right now actually. Um, there's this, uh, and you would fall under the old programs. There's this line in the sand here which is the start date. Some some people like to call it the launch date. That's when an LDC will officially launch into their new funding bucket. Okay, and so you can start now into the 15 to 20 uh, programs. So, um, thing to bear in mind is that this is to 2020. So this is a six-year program. So. If you kind of uh, are into this program, you've got six years to finish your projects and you can also plan on doing capital projects six years into the future. There's a huge runway in front of us in this regard. As I said before, um, success to me looks like a seamless transition for you, my customer. Okay, there really shouldn't be a whole lot of, of, uh, of tripping hazards in here. I'm, going to, I'm actually going to focus in on the two that might occur, but Again, we're here to work with you. And this is very important as well, that between 2011, uh, the incentive levels in the old programs, at least in 2015, will be unchanged. Why is that significant? Well, remember what I said that there was a transition from the old targets for LDCs being kilowatts and kilowatt hours to kilowatt hours only? So you would be correct to assume that at some point in the future, our incentives are going to zero in only on the kilowatt hour basis. But in order to kind of smooth the transition between the old and the new, for the foreseeable future, 
we actually will be respecting the old either $800 or $400 a kilo, uh, per kilowatt incentive that currently exists. And in all of the, uh, the administration is working so that you won't actually see any difference uh, during 2015. However, incentive rates may change starting in 2016. As we start to um, develop the new programs getting beyond the kind of transition of the old, you can expect to see some changes. So what this means is that uh, if you happen to have projects that are, say, uh, cooling intensive, uh, that will save a lot of cooling energy, you may be better off to try to get them in in 2015 uh, because the incentives that you might be otherwise able to get in 2016 may not be quite so handsome. Uh, when you're living in our particular climate, our cooling doesn't really work that long. If you were based in the southern states, the amount of energy you consume in cooling energy is quite large. So if you save cooling energy, you're into some big incentives. Up here, if you're looking at cooling measures, you're looking at, at uh, harvesting the dollars per kilowatt or the demand basis of incentives. So there's a little bit of an advantage for you to, to do that sooner rather than later. Okay. Now, you'll notice <clears throat> that if you happen to create a, an application for a project under the old regime, you actually do have a deadline. You have a deadline here, which is the end of 2015. Um, this is one of the complications of having separate funding buckets. So if you're going to be, get paid in the background out of this funding bucket, we have to get it closed. We have that funding bucket has to be shut down by the end of the year. So that creates a couple of challenges, and that's what I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. What happens if you don't finish by that time? We'll talk about that. The other thing, too, and some of you may have already started to receive letters from your LDC about this, is as we get to the end of the, the program, and LDCs haven't been too troubled by this. I mean, there always has been a 150-day deadline between your completing your project um, and submitting the paperwork. Um, we weren't overly stressed out on, of, it, of enforcing it. But now that we're reaching the end of the program, we have to be a bit more diligent. And we've started, as have others as well, sending out letters of reminder to, to customers to, uh, to be aware of this 150-day limitation. The danger, of course, is that under the old program, the way it works is that when you finish your program, we have to apply to ISO to get the money that we're going to pay you with. And if you're outside of the rules, then you may not get the money, and there's nothing we can do about it. So uh, that's one of the things that you agree to when you sign your, uh, your participant agreement. Unfortunately, this is one thing that we will have to start enforcing simply because from an accounting standpoint, we're running out of runway to pay you here. There's lots of money there, but you know how bean counters are? And my apologies to any accountants in the audience. You have to keep that straight. So um, what does the continuation of the program look like? As I said, uh, we're continuing across all fronts. So the retrofit program, which is the the main program that you probably submit your incentives for will continue. The audit funding program is continuing, and that incidentally includes the, the, the very popular building systems audit, which is a subset of that. I'll get into that during the second part of my presentation today. High performance new construction is continuing, but there's a, a proviso there that there's a new building code coming into effect in 2017, and so the current uh, a version of the incentive program requires that your building permit has to be submitted before 2017 because the standards with the new code are going to go up and it's going to become that much higher. We're going to have to redesign that program in a significant way. Um, the process and systems uh, uh, program, which has a, comes in different uh, assortment of sizes and flavors, there's the, the normal upgrade initiative, uh, there's the small capital projects, the embedded energy manager, which is very popular, uh, monitoring and targeting, and, and the various studies. Those are also continuing, largely as is. One that is being replaced is the small business lighting, and this is the one that provides for $1,500 per, per instance for each business. So that one is, uh, is ending in... Uh, 
in 2015. Uh, the reason is it's been, a, as you might expect, it's been a very expensive program. Um, so we're not sort of saying goodbye to it entirely. We're overhauling it and we're bringing out, you know, a new and improved version that's a little bit more cost effective. Okay. So um, if this is the part where you may not necessarily have a project that falls into this situation, uh, but there's a couple of scenarios that uh, I'd like to review with you. First of all, you might have a project that started under the 2011 to 14 regime, but and you fully expected it to finish in 2015, but stuff happens. You know, you could have had a strike, you could have had uh, a hold on funding, whatever it was, and the project, uh, for whatever reason, isn't going to finish until 2016. So that's one of the kind of trip wires that that exists. So. Um, what we need to do there is, uh, so this, you've sort of seen this before, this is my 2011 to 14, here's my runway to finish that project by the end of 2015, and it looks like that project may not, not finish. That's the case here. Um, so really, projects that are not finishing in time, the intent is to port them over into the new program regime. So it kind of looks something like that. All right. Graphically, that's what we're trying to do. Um, in principle, the customer incentive is to be protected. So if you submitted your business case way back, or you're back here for a project and you launched your project here, and you didn't finish it as per plan and it kind of leaked over, we're not going to come back to you and say, oh, by the way, your, your incentive is now different because you were counting on in that incentive as part of the business case for your project. So we'll respect that. Um, however, the exact mechanism it hasn't, isn't clear yet because we do have a little bit of time. And the reason is there's a couple of different ways. The lawyers are trying to figure out what's the most simplest way of doing that. So stay tuned on that. Um, if you have a project that it falls into this, your best course of action is to become really good friends with your LDC and, and make sure that, that they're aware that there is a delay potentially uh, happening so that uh, we can kind of guide you into the right corral here. <clears throat> so in the 15 to 20 programs, the, the, all of the, the, there's a two generations. And the first generation is really um, what we've been calling the, the, the very first set of, of projects that fall in this, you know, starting in 2015, and we keep the current incentive rates. Later on, there's going to be a second generation of, of programs which may or may not uh, change the incentives. Um, certainly, the basis will change, I would think, into a kilowatt hour basis. Uh, however, um, we'll also be building in new and, new and additional improvements. So, the really big C changes that you can expect to see will happen with the second generation. The first generation is really just making all of the projects kind of trans transition smooth, if you will. And I'll, I'll kind of use first and second generation through the presentation. The second type of transition project is one where, um, well, if, you're, if you have a, a, a project that's going to take, say, a year, to build, and I'm going to use, say you want to build a, com a combined heating and, and uh, uh, generating plant, for example, um, and it's going to take you 18 months, two years to build. So there's no way you can finish by the end of 2015, but your LDC may not have actually started in paying from the second bucket of funds. Well, what do you do there? That's what this is about. So here's the situation here. You've got a project that you want to start right here. And that project completion could be way off in 2016. A couple of problems. First of all, your LDC may not actually have launched yet. And secondly, if they haven't launched, you want to be able to lock in your incentive rate. So those are the two challenges right now that, we, um, that we're aware of. And so the good news is that um, uh, working with the ISO, we've kind of developed a, a mechanism by which we can, we can help you to sign on a, a program application for the new program, even if the LDC hasn't necessarily uh, uh, launched yet. What that means is that you're signed up, you're good to go, even if that LDC may not necessarily have, uh, 
have uh, uh, launched. In our case, we're ready to go. In fact, we've got a couple of, of customers who are looking at uh, large chiller projects. They're not going to finish, finish out until the summer of 2016. So they actually can't sign under this regime. They have to sign under the new. But if we haven't launched it, how do they do that? That's just paper. So we've found a way around that. If that's your situation, again, um, what you should be doing is contacting your LDC. Talk to me, talk to us, and we'll make sure that uh, we keep you whole. Um, the interesting thing, of course, is that under this first generation of programs, the old incentive rates uh, still apply. Um, and it, it actually applies to all of the, uh, the incentive programs, the list of which I went through before. Okay. Um, so, in a nutshell, the CDM program evolution is in three stages. Sorry, you can't, can't see that that well, but that's the interim transition programs or the first generation programs. And those ones are generally going to be around for 2015. Then we're going to get into the redesign programs or the so-called second generation starting in late 2015, uh, 2016. And then there will be additional programs developed and, and they can start any time. Uh, what I'm going to do next is I'm actually going to give you a, a peek of three different uh, pilots that we at uh, Toronto Hydro are working with ISO on. The idea for a pilot is you want to kick the tires a bit, you want to take it for a test drive uh, at first and then you learn what you can and then you launch it as a province-wide program with all of the learnings associated with what you found out during the pilot. So. You can look at the pilots I'm going to tell you as a sort of a, a preview of the kind of program you can expect to see. And the reason why you can expect to see that, and I can give you some certainty of that, is that remember what I said at the beginning of the presentation, our targets are effectively twice what they were before. I can tell you that unless we have these programs in markets, we will not meet our targets. Therefore, we've got a huge uh, motivation in order to get these programs in, in, the, in market. The first one I want to tell you about is uh, uh, RTU Saver, uh, which stands for Rooftop Unit. And what that is, is that's a combination of a, uh, a, a demand control ventilation strategy using CO2 sensors to verify the, the amount of outside air that we're bringing in and kind of matching it up with, uh, with the actual occupancy level and combining that with controls and especially a variable frequency drive to control your evaporator fan. What that manages to do is when you, when you buy a rooftop unit, the sizing of the fan is really driven by the need for air conditioning in the summertime. You don't need that much air during the heating season. Um, so this is one place where we think you'll be able to get a lot of savings. So the idea here is that th at the moment this particular program is a, uh, a direct install program, which means that we pay for the whole kit and caboodle. Now, uh, in the future, I don't know whether or not we'll be able to pay for all of 100%. It'll, there might be some cost sharing in the future. The, the, um, so we're kind of eager to see what the results uh, look like. Um, this particular pilot, uh, incidentally, all of these images you see are off of our website, so you could go in and have a look under pilots for additional information. I think um, the, the funding for the pilots tends to be somewhat uh, limited, so I think we've already fully subscribed on this one. So this isn't so much I'm looking for participants as this is just a preview of the kind of program you can expect to see in the future. The next one I'm going to tell you about is Pump Saver. And, um, the reality is, and I can, I can attest to this because uh, this is the, the life I used to live before, engineers don't want to be woken up in the middle of a cold winter night by a building owner to say, you bum, you undersized my pump. What are you going to do about it? So we typically uh, safe size things. And then the contractor, when they buy the pump, they never buy a pump that's smaller and, and they can get a better price with this pump here so they'll go one size off and of course there's all those safety factors when you design buildings anyway so chances are your pumps are way oversized and and so what we would like to do is to install a variable frequency drive to use uh, uh, software to slow down that pump rather than the old way of trimming your impeller nobody really does that too much anymore what we do is we slow the pump down a bit so that's again a direct install program where we would pay hundred percent of the cost of that that's what we're piloting. Um, I think this one's now been fully subscribed to as well. The next one hasn't. Um, this one is um, 
uh, op saver. So optimize your process or operational savings. This is one we've been talking about with our customers for a few years now. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to use continuous improvement within facilities to drive savings and sometimes can be anywhere from 5 to 15 percent typically uh, within the site. The key thing about this, and I really love this, is under the old programs you have to spend money in order to be eligible for incentives. If you didn't spend money, I'm sorry, we had this little clause that said your incentive will be up to 50% of your, of your project cost. If your project cost was zero, 50% of zero was zero, therefore we gave you zero. Um, this was meant to encourage equipment replacement. So the retrofit program is actually known as an equipment replacement incentive initiative. This is different. This is, you could have bought the stuff three years ago. The question is, will you be able to operate it more efficiently and can you maintain that? And the notion here is that we will give you an incentive every year that you hit your target. Kind of cool. Um, the, uh, the target for this in, uh, uh, pilot, we're looking for office buildings uh, around uh, 4 gigawatt uh, hour consumption per year. You know, if you, if, that, if you assume a 40 kilowatt hour per square foot, that's a 100,000 square foot office building, for example. So there's a couple of other provisos as well, but if you think you have a building in mind that may have a lot of opportunity, there could still be a couple of spots left open for this, and if you're interested, please let me know, and if you can't catch me, um, go on the website and there's a contact, Tom Fultinacopoulos in my office, who uh, would be uh, happy to speak with you. But uh, these three programs are programs that we really hope to see in some fashion or other as part of the spectrum of, of, of new and improved programs that are, are, are out there. Other LDCs are working on their uh, own favorites. These are ones that are near and dear to our heart. So, um, just to kind of summarize what's happening on the program innovation side, we've got uh, new province-wide programs that we're developing. I've shown you some of the pilots, and I said there are others that are being worked on as well. We also have a couple of really interesting ones, which at the working group level we're undertaking with some serious uh, study and examination. We're looking at uh, upstream, midstream type of incentives. So right now, if you were to buy a brand new rooftop unit, as an example, you would have to go through the incentive program. The, the idea here is, wouldn't it be nice if the distributor already applied the incentive at the point of sale to save all that, all that uh, work? You might even be able to apply it to things like air compressors. You might even be able to apply it to things like variable frequency drives. The reality of the marketplace is that we know that there are thousands of variable frequency drives sold in Ontario, yet we only see at any given time a sliver of those through the programs. It's unfortunate. So in the states where they've had versions of this, this program, they've been wildly successful. So that's something that we're in, keenly interested in working on. And as I said before, you've, you've seen the pilot on the operational savings. Um, I will admit right now that the landscape as it currently exists with programs such as monitoring and targeting under Erie, monitoring and targeting under process and systems, the existing building commissioning program, building automation systems under Erie, they all sort of kind of do similar things and you almost need a Sherpa to find the way up the mountain, okay? Um, we've been happily doing that work, but we, faster than anyone will admit, we should be better at kind of streamlining and, and educating our customers as to what they can do. So we'll probably kind of streamline those programs uh, in second generation and, and beyond. The other thing too is, uh, again, collaboration with the gas utilities. And where's my friend Chris Hamilton? Are you still, there he is there, he's from Enbridge. Um, we've always kind of been at these sessions together. And um, as I said before, Enbridge has, uh, I'm not sure if it's Enbridge or it could be Union, has a place on my working group. The idea is that as we move forward, the programs, if we're successful, will be highly um, integrated. So if you do have projects that uh, have technologies that are kind of ACDC, if you know what I mean, uh, talk to us. Also talk to my friend Chris or any of his colleagues um, because you can double dip. Okay, You can get an incentive from us. You can get an incentive from them. All right? And um, again, the, the governance structure to, to make sure that we keep, uh, keep on track and, and stay honest. 
So in summary, um, and I'm almost right on time here, uh, the CDM programs are continuing. Um, it's business as usual, please carry on. Uh, make sure that uh, you continue to factor in capital programs within your uh, or energy saving initiatives within your capital pro uh, projects moving forward. Uh, we're here, our team at my office is growing to serve you better. Um, again, because my targets are twice as much as they were before. And uh, we're also uh, including a lot more technical resources as well. So if you have uh, a, a bit of a gap in terms of you're not quite sure whether technically you can do this, we might be able to give you some assistance to get you to the next, uh, next phase as well. And stay tuned for new program announcements as we go uh, through 2015. So with that note, uh, I'm going to draw to a close part one of my session today, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions you may have on either the materials or something I may not have covered this morning in terms of where the new programs are, are going. Uh, if this suffices, uh, you know, you're welcome to kind of bow out uh, quietly and gracefully if you wish. The next part that I'll start in about 10 minutes or so will be uh, a review of the basics. And what this covers is the, the programs that, um, uh, that are continuing, and if you're not familiar with them, and this, is, this happens all the time. You may have been familiar with some of the programs, but now you may be at a point, a point where you're interested in some of the other stuff, and this may be a good opportunity for you to, to refresh what that means. Well, folks, thank you very much. It's a pleasure hosting you this morning, and I hope you have a great day.